Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sri's daily global COVID-19 show. It's my honor to convene this daily conversation around all things COVID-19. We go pretty far from our original mission talking only about COVID, but we do spend our time discussing three aspects of this crisis, the health, financial, and inequality parts of the crisis. We're always looking for guests and suggestions. Sri at Sri.net is my email address. Today is episode 177. That's right, we've been on air for 177 days in a row, and our 180th episode, our six-month episode, is coming up on Sunday. Today, we have a very special guest with us and a very special topic. How about this? Learning from philosophers. Eric Weiner was with us, the author of The Socrates Express in Search of Life Lessons from Dead Philosophers, the best-selling author of The Geography of Bliss. His books have been translated into more than 20 languages. He is an awesome interview, I know, because I've interviewed him before, and you will love meeting him and learning from him. And I've been waiting to talk to him throughout this pandemic, and I'm so excited to have him on here. You'll meet him in just a minute. First, let me say hello, everybody. Hi, I'm Sri, and I'm the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation at Stony Brook School of Journalism and the co-founder of DigiMentors, a social, digital, and virtual events consulting business. I tell folks, don't cancel your event without talking to us. Don't even plan your virtual event without getting in touch with us first. My email address is right there, Sri at Sri.net. We love geeking out on virtual events. We've done events for 50 people and 100,000 people. I bet your event is somewhere in between. When people think, this is my job, this is an ad for my job. We'd love to build you a virtual event or build you a talk show like this. If you'd like to do one, get in touch. We can talk about it. We are so grateful to all of you for being here. Well, let's tell you a little bit about the show. In the first 165 episodes, we had more than a million viewers, 122 million social impressions, more than 300 guests, 175 of them women. We're gonna up that ratio. Guests from 62 cities, 16 countries, including the chief scientist of the World Health Organization. And we can do this because of our friends at scroll.in and scroll global, please check them out. And please check out our archives, youtube.com slash net and our producers, Rose Horowitz at Rose Horowitz 31 and Vandana Menon, Vandana underscore Menon. We're also very grateful to our sponsors who we will thank in just a few minutes. But first, we want to give you a chance to meet my friend, Eric. You're gonna learn a lot from him. We're gonna have a great time together. Please tag your friends right now. We're live on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, and on LinkedIn. And your friends can watch now or later as soon as we're off the air. So with, with that, please say hello to Eric. Hi. Hey, Shri, good to see you. Good to see you. The last time we did this, we I was doing a podcast for CBS, and it was on... Uh, it was several years ago, and it was all on the radio on uh, in, a, in a studio, you know, down uh, in Midtown Manhattan that I was on. You were on the phone. Here I am now constrained to this little, I think it's about eight square feet of my apartment where I'm allowed to uh, function. Everything else, the, my wife and uh, the twins who are 17 are all in charge of the rest of the house and the dog. So this is my studio. Do, do they do they let you out sometimes, occasionally, for so you know, for food and water? I, I should say I'm really blessed because all three of the humans, other humans in the house, love to cook. So a plate of food okay. to arrive. It's a way to keep, keep me keep arriving. Here. <laughs> they just keep me here. But I do want to start. But all our shows, we ask, "How are you? Where are you? And how did you and your family manage through the pandemic?" Let me start with where I am. I am in uh, the beautiful little town of Silver Spring, Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C. How am I? I am uh, contemplative, I would say, um, which, as we're going to discuss, I would argue is, is a good way to be. And uh, my wife and teenage daughter and dog and two cats are all just outside that door. Um, and uh, we have weathered the pandemic fairly well, not good so far. And, um, you know, just a little bit of claustrophobia is all we've suffered. And so I count us among the lucky ones there. And I'm so glad to hear you're okay. 
over my shoulder, you see your book right here, The Socrates Express. The other book you see, you next, was our guest last night, Antonio Johnson. It was fantastic talking about the culture of black barber shops. And everyone who didn't get a chance to see it, please go back and watch and find all my archives on youtube.com slash 3net. And please follow Eric. He's on Twitter, Eric underscore Weiner. And there's, you can pronounce the name in many ways, but he says there's an easy way to remember how to pronounce his name. Somebody who wines a lot and likes to drink wine, I would say. And that covers you pretty well, right? Pretty much the whole spectrum there, Sri. You know, <laughs> right there. That's great. So let's talk about this book. It is In Search of Life's Lessons from Dead Philosophers. Tell us how you decided to write this book. We'll also talk about The Geography of Bliss, an awesome book that did so well. Uh, also, what it's like to publish during the pandemic. So we'll cover all those topics. But let's start with what is the meaning, not of life, but of this book. Well, it started with this gadget, actually, um, my iPhone XS, whatever, my iThing. Um, and I, I I picked it up and I realized that it's like it's a miracle on the one hand, because with the swipe of a finger, I can access all of human knowledge, pretty much from the ancient Egyptians to theoretical physics. Um, and if you think about it, this is incredible. Never before in human history has the average person, someone like me or you, had this thing we carry around in our pocket that gives us access to this unprecedented amount of information and knowledge, really. Um, yet, are we happier? And if we're not, what's lacking in our life? And and what is lacking in this gadget? And I think the answer is is wisdom. You know, and there's a difference between there's a difference between information and knowledge, and knowledge and wisdom. Um, Information is just sort of raw bits of data, right? Knowledge is a more organized, organized um, structure of these information bits. Um, but wisdom is something different. Um, wisdom is not a what or a why, it's a how. It's how to live our lives, what to do with the knowledge. Um, there was a British uh, musician named Miles Kington who said the difference between uh, knowledge and wisdom is knowledge know is knowing that the tomato is a fruit and wisdom is not putting it in fruit salad. And we are knowledgeable, but we're not very wise. And it turns out there's this untapped source of really just great wisdom out there. And it's called philosophy, which uh, means literally love of wisdom. That's where the ancient Greek word philosophos means. That's where it comes from. And... I'm hoping that this book will change people's minds about philosophy, that it's not some difficult, arcane subject that you're going to flunk out of in college, that it's actually a great way to teach you not what to think, but how to think. And why did you call it Socrates? You had many options of philosophers. Talk about that. Yeah, so Socrates is a sort of stand-in for all of philosophy. He was not the first philosopher. Many came before him, but we now call them pre-Socratics. But he was the first one to really ask a different kind of question. Not, you know, what is the nature of reality or why is there something rather than nothing? But again, that how question. How can we lead richer, more meaningful lives? How can we be better people? Um, Socrates, it's been said, was the first person to call philosophy down from the heavens and introduce it into people's homes. So he's sort of the patron saint of philosophy and the first martyr because he was killed by his fellow Athenians um, for on trumped up charges, which is often the case. Uh, really, he what he was guilty of was asking people a lot of pesky, annoying questions. And they didn't like that back then any more than we'd like it today. And they put him to death for that reason. Um, but he, he really pushed people's buttons because he would come to you, Shri, and, and, and he would say, um, you know, why are you wearing that shirt? And you would say, well, because I like that shirt. It's my favorite shirt. But do you really know why? Is there, you know, it looks a bit like a kurta. Is it because of your Indian heritage? Is it because it's the only clean shirt you have? He would really probe you on this question. And he would also may force you to to sort of interrogate yourself and your own motivation. You know, maybe I'm just wearing this shirt because I think it projects a certain image, but do have I really thought this through? And so Socrates really believed that we sort of stumble um, half blind through life 
um, with all of these assumptions about who we are and how we're living our lives without stopping to question them. And that to me is what philosophy is at its best. It's to pause, to stop, and to ask questions of yourself. Love it. And one of the things, of course, is the Socratic method that you just described. And okay. when I went to journalism school at Columbia, and then I okay. taught there for 20 years, Fred Friendly, the legendary American journalist and television pro executive producer who worked with the equal, even more legendary Edward R. Murrow, used to do the Socratic method style conversations and pushing people. And, right. uh, and uh, it was, was the, the work that he was doing and th that style, was it known as the Socratic method then itself? Was he recognized? Uh, in, uh, in probably, own? it's been around for 2,500 years. So unless you were in journalism school more than 2,500 years ago, uh, it, it, it is the Socratic method. And, and that's the thing. And, and one of the key differences between knowledge and wisdom is that knowledge is, is perishable right? We, we don't study the ancient Greeks for their pharmacology or their technology, really. Um, you don't want to be doing that because we've moved on. But when it comes to wisdom, the how of life, um, the, the ancient Greeks and, and other philosophers, I, there's some 14 in my book, they're, they're much closer and more relevant than we think. Because wisdom is portable, it transcends space and time. So, you know, just this is a show about partly about COVID and what we're living through. You know, we think we're living through unprecedented times, but we're, we're not really. I mean, p humans have come before us who have lived through pandemics and epidemics and plagues, much worse than this actually. And they've thought about how to react to it and what to do about it and how to endure it. And I think we'd be foolish to, you know, to ignore that wisdom. Thank you. Uh, before we take a break uh, and do what we call our world tour of people watching from around the world, they're commenting right now, telling us where they're watching from. They're also sharing the show with their friends and family. You'll also hear at some point how, uh, or we'll hear from Eric about living in India, in, in Delhi in the 1990s, a very different India, as he told me. Uh, one of the things that I want to talk to you about and why I've been wanting to have you on the show is to think about how the world isn't exactly what we had thought it would be during a true pandemic. And what I mean by that is every movie, every novel about a dystopian future has two things uh, missing from it that we have today, the internet and electricity, right? And the food chain, you know, the food supply, things like that. Uh, is it something about the imagination of, of writers and philosophers and everybody else that they always presume that when bad stuff happens, it has to be like that and not the way it is now. I, of course, much prefer this than a Planet of the Apes uh, and, uh, and all those other movies. No, that's, that's an interesting, I, I've never heard this raised. This is an, an interesting question. Um, I mean, I think as humans, we're pretty bad at predicting the future, right? We, we, don't, uh, we don't make room for the unforeseen. So, for instance, in, in 1900, there was a survey done of the city of New York that predicted by the year 1945, Manhattan would be under six feet of horse manure because they had not foreseen the advent of the automobile. Um, that, so there wouldn't be this growth in horse-drawn carriages. Um, so we, we tend to assume that the future will be just like the present, only more so. Um, we tend to take... Uh, Kind of, we have a, I think, a weirdly schizophrenic view of the future in that we see it as sort of better than today and yet worse at the same time. Um, the technology will be better, but we don't see human nature changing the way we see technology changing. If you look at all these futuristic novels and, and movies, and you, you even just think about the word the future, what do you think of? You tend to think of technology, the Jetsons and flying cars and all that. But do you think about um, the kind of subjects I write about in my book, about wisdom, about, you know, will, will people love differently? Will they be kinder to each other? Um, will they see more beauty in the world? We, we, don't, we don't imagine the future that way. We only imagine it in terms of change technology. And I think that's a, that's a blind spot that we have. 
What can people find at Eric Weiner's uh, website, Eric Weiner Books, uh, all one word, dot com? What else is on here? Obviously, your books, but what else? Oh, there's a Q and A with me. There's some of the articles I've written, um, and there's a photo. Can you, if you go to the the um, actually the main page, uh, the home page, you will see a uh, photo which I love, which is taken by a great uh, photographer in Bulgaria because that is in Bulgaria, and um, I love that photo. I'm standing alongside my publisher, a great man named Neko Genchev. And for some reason, Sri, uh, my books are very popular in two countries, Indonesia and Bulgaria. And so uh, my Neko said, you have to come to Bulgaria. I came there. Um, they they uh, granted me an honorary PhD from a, a university there. I met the foreign minister. And um, I like to think that everyone's famous in a different country. And my country is Bulgaria. What's yours, Sri? <laughs> uh, these, these eight feet, these eight square. They had eight feet. You've got that space. Yeah, I own this space until my wife needs to get something from the bureau here. So that's, uh, that's right. I'm... So that that's a picture of Bulgaria, yep. and um, and I, I teach writing workshops uh, twice a year. Once, usually in Kathmandu, with my friend James Hopkins. This year, we're going online with the writing workshops. Hope to be back in the Himalayas next year. Um, and yeah, I have a, a, a certain fondness and soft spot for South Asia, um, having lived there and spent a lot of time there. And that is a very special part of the world for so many of us. And we're so glad that we can talk about that with Eric in just a few minutes. We are going to do our global tour, but first we're going to uh, thank our sponsors. And Eric, there's also a chance for you to catch your breath and also make sure you're shared on Twitter. And if you go into your Facebook, I'm sure people are responding there now, and you can say hello there as well. So we'll give you a chance to do that. Folks, you're listening to my interview with Eric Weiner. Here is his book, The Socrates Express, Life Lessons from Dead Philosophers. We're going to talk about the philosophers in his book, including Socrates, of course, but Rousseau and Gandhi and others. So please stay tuned. First, we must thank our sponsors who make this show possible. We have uh, so many that... Uh, supported us, and now we're on a hundred and we're uh, getting ready for a hundred and eightieth episode. That means six months of this show. So please uh, thank our sponsors as we say hello to Muckrack Academy, which is uh, which helped me put together fundamentals of social media for journalists, PR pros, and everyone. Free certification available, and that means. Anybody can take this course, mrac.co slash social, mrac.co slash social, and you get a free certificate. More than 4,000 people have done the course, so should you. Nonbelievable.com, divinely delicious cookies on a mission. Each handcrafted cookie provides a meal to those in need. One cookie equals one meal, 20% off with the code SREE, S-R-E-E. -E. We also want to thank our friend Charles Cunnan Carroll, and his book, The Inventor in You, a step-by-step -step guide to your first invention. And Charles is the developer of more than 80 patents. His Twitter handle is at Inventor Charles. And Guide to Invention.com is his book. In our class that I teach at Stony Brook, we talk about innovation and invention, including during times of crisis. So please check that out. At the, the book is called The Inventor in You, Guide to Invention. Dot com and our event partner rise or fall together the one shared world interdependence summit thursday september 17th a free conference 9 a.m to noon amazing speakers including david nabarro the who director general's special envoy for covid 19 and the legendary renee fleming and our company digimentors is producing that show and we want to also thank for promotional consideration And uh, please check out hotstar.com slash US. And we want to thank She's On Call. Sundays at 11 a.m. Eastern, She's On Call is two surgeons interviewing other doctors, Dr. Sujanak Chandrasekhar and Dr. Marina Kurian interviewing doctors of all kinds. This past week, they had a colon surgeon talking about Chadwick Boseman, a rehab doctor talking about the importance of 
understanding that after COVID patients have recovered, many of them have to take great pains in COVID recovery and rehab. So with that, let's now bring back our guest on stage. Our guest is Eric Weiner, the author of The Socrates Express, In Search of Life Lessons from Dead Philosophers. And we're just so delighted to have him here with us. We've already laughed a lot and learned a lot, and that will continue for the rest of this, uh, the rest of the hour that we have together. So please welcome Eric once again onto our stage. Hi, Eric. Hope you Hi, to, uh, catch your breath. And uh, we want to just give you our world tour. And so as we talk about, as people say hello, please tell us if you have a memory of the place or you've been there or you know something about it, or it's, we used to call it bucket list. Someone said, I don't like bucket list because, you know, there's that death associated. So they called it a life list. And Jonathan Borstein is watching from the East Village. He's watched 177 straight episodes of this show. And we're so grateful. I've been to the, the exotic East Village. I have been there. Yes. And tell us, do you, uh, do you have a favorite memory of New York that? Um, I, my first date with my, uh, wife, who's in the other room listening now, uh, was at an Indian restaurant on East 6th Street in the village called Kismat. And uh, Sri, I think you know what Kismat means? Yes. It means fate or destiny. And um, it was uh, it was a good sign, I guess. So um, this, was the, this is the row of Indian restaurants. Are they, are they still there? I hope they're still there. Um, they survived, yes. Most of them are Bangladeshi now, but they're still they were. They've always been Bangladeshis. Bangladeshis opened a restaurant they call it Taj Mahal immediately because it sells better. Um, good hey, marketing. I opened a casino called it Taj Mahal. So I, exactly. So why can't a Bangladeshi open a restaurant called Taj Mahal? So we we had our first date there, um, and she had an apartment on First Avenue, uh, like a uh, twenty-seven story walk up or something like that. And so I've got uh, I've got fond memories of the East Village. So so far we're batting a hundred. I feel like this is a game show, and I will win something at the end. All right. Let's let's see. Our our friend Rose Horowitz is watching from Connecticut and uh, is uh, talking, uh, is, is going to be live tweeting and sharing what you're saying here. So I've great. been to Connecticut. The great and, state of Connecticut. You have to say the great state of Connecticut. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> is, this, is this the, uh, you know, is this the Republican convention? Uh, I, I guess so, yeah. <laughs> and look at this, Deborah Kerr says, hello, Eric, your book arrived today. Can't wait to oh, Deborah. Oh, hi, Deborah. I know Deborah. Great. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and Deborah is a regular viewer, so thank you, Deborah. All right. And, and Deborah says, "Bliss." I think she's talking about your book, "The Geography of Bliss." Uh, tell us about she, that book. Yeah, that was my first book, and that was uh, me uh, having an existential crisis of as a foreign correspondent for NPR and sort of enjoying my job, but realizing how much the work of journalists necessarily focuses on the worst of humanity. Um, you know that you're 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 getting up and you're looking for places that are uh, bereft by war, famine, disease, and you're reporting on it. It's important, it's necessary, but it was kind of uh, bumming me out. So I had this epiphany one morning that what if I spent a year going around the world looking for the happiest places? And what could we learn from them? And um, and what could, what could I learn from them? And then my second epiphany was what if I got NPR to pay for me to go around the world for a year? And uh, that didn't turn out, but... <laughs> I wrote a book instead, and um, and it's a good book. I think it's it's about um, the connection between happiness and place, and different flavors of happiness around the world, and how we can learn uh, uh, good things from other countries too, and and not only the bad. We those of us who don't pay enough attention, we think Denmark and Bhutan are high in that list of happy places. Denmark is high, uh, does very well. Uh, Bhutan doesn't actually do that well in these happiness surveys, but of course they had this famous, by now famous policy of gross national happiness. Um, the way I like to describe it is, um, you know, everyone's playing by one rule of soccer and then Bhutan comes along and changes the rules and says maybe the goal should be moved over here, right? Instead of gross national product, maybe nations should be focusing on gross national happiness so you can change the rules of the game and not necessarily be the best at the game and i think that's the case of bhutan it's a fairly happy place but what they really stand out is by changing the way we think of 
What's the goal of a country? Is it to make its citizens richer or to make them happier? And this small country in the Himalayas has really changed the conversation. And I give them great credit for that. I lived in Bhutan as a tiny kid and uh, the, it's a beautiful place. And if people get a chance, you know, when we travel, well, we end up on this show talking so much about travel because everyone's remembering where they used to go. You did that when you mentioned, you know, going back to the Himalayas for your yeah. writing workshop in Kathmandu. Everybody, uh, it's called retrospective travel. <laughs> we're we're looking back and we're fondling our souvenirs and we're look, thumbing through the photo albums and that's okay. I think that's you know that's okay. I lived in Moscow, and in honor of the Russian meddling, we have these uh, Matrushka dolls here as well. Saumya Malik is watching from India. Tell us about living in India in the 90s. So this was the, during the time of Prime Minister Narsimha Rao, if anyone remembers him. Um, this was 1993, 94, 95, about that time period. And NPR had never really had a correspondent in Delhi, and I had never been to India, and I signed up for this assignment. Uh, kind of, in, it was either courageous or incredibly stupid, depending on how you look at it. But I landed in Delhi with, you know, two trunks of all my belongings, a fax machine, which I used to send my radio scripts, and uh, found an apartment in a little neighborhood called Nizamuddin in, uh, in Delhi. And I set up shop. And I had this entire country of, at the time, nearly a billion people to report on. And it was it was the best years of my life, I have to say. It was um, India was just opening up to the world economically. Um, it was sort of on the cusp between old India and new India. It was a wonderful time to be there, and um, it changed my life for the better. A couple of memories, and by the way, for those who aren't haven't spent time in Delhi or that part of India, uh, you said you were in Nizamuddin. Uh, great place for food, and after that, yeah. you must have found the Sixth uh, East Sixth Street restaurants not as good. <laughs> That's true. Um, even just a, a bad restaurant in, in India is better than a good rest Indian restaurant in New York, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I mean, it was. Um, you know, I think um, the way I like to think of India is that you go you go stand on any street corner and you turn around three hundred and sixty degrees in any Indian city. And you will see the best and the worst of humanity. The, the range of possibilities, good and bad, I think is greater in India than anywhere else. Um, and I, you know, I sort of fell in love with uh, the writings and the ideas of Gandhiji. And I, um, I read almost everything he wrote and I read about him and I went to his ashrams. And, um, you know, I, I had I, I was not a devotee, I would say. I had my eyes open to his his flaws. He was by no means a saint. Um, but I just found his ideas very compelling. And this was the first real opportunity in this book, the one off of your left shoulder there, um, that I had to to write about him um directly. And um I felt like it was it was sort of like a lifetime's worth of thinking and and reading about Gandhi. Uh, sort of condensed into this one chapter in the book. He was one of my 14 philosophers. And some people would don't, many people, in fact, would not consider him a philosopher. It's not the first thing that comes to mind, right? They think of him as a political leader, a national hero, um, all kinds of things. But um, I think he definitely was a philosopher, but his domain was action. He said this many times that, you know, he famously said, my life is my message. Um, that if you want to know what Gandhi's philosophy was, you don't have to you don't have to read him so much as watch him what he did. Yeah, uh, I love the dedication here or the quote: "Sooner or later, life makes philosophers of us all." Maurice Riesling. Yeah, Riesling. and it's true. Uh, Riesling, Riesling, and it's true. Um, that, I think it's wine, by the way, you know that. Yeah, um, <laughs> that you know, even if you've never considered yourself. A, a philosopher or having a philosophical bone in your body, chances are sometime in the last six months, mm -hmm. you've asked questions that you haven't before. And they're not just questions like, it, did I wash my hands enough today? You know, not just questions like that, but questions like, am I, am I leading the right life? Am I doing what I'm meant to be doing? Um, Am, am I going to endure this, you know, because 
you know, there's there's no end point, you know. I think that humans are capable of enduring great suffering as long as they know that there's light at the end of the proverbial tunnel. And we haven't quite seen that yet. So, you know, it's during times like this that people turn to religion and they turn to science. And I think they should turn more to philosophy because there's there's a lot to it, much more than, than we think. And it certainly helps us understand and sometimes make sense of everything that's happening around us. We've only been talking about the last six months. The next 65 days or so to the election is going to be such a mess. It's going to be so awful, uh, it, not, not just for Americans, but because the repercussions of what happens here will affect the rest of our lives for sure and our children's lives. Uh, and that's what we worry about. Charles Cunnan Carroll's watching with Mary in New Jersey, the great state of New Jersey. We have Yeah, you got it, the great yeah, state yeah. of New Jersey. Okay. And, uh, and Charles is one of our sponsors, so we're always happy to see him Good watch choice. as well. And Deb, Debbie says, reviewed the geography of bliss for my book club when it came out. Great storytelling. And you can tell everybody who's listening now can hear in Eric the great storytelling that's also there in the book. Alex, Alex is tagging his friends. Everybody do this including he tagged Joe Rogan. So I hope he get books you for his, uh, for his podcast. If he you really have. should. Um, yeah. no, it's interesting. Let's talk for a second about radio and, and the spoken word. Um, can we, there's no agenda here, right? Trey, this is, this is free form. But uh, I, I, yeah. Yeah. I love, um, you know, and I miss, uh, I was at NPR for 15 years and I miss that. I have to say as much as I like my life now, I miss what we're doing now, this conversation, uh, the spoken word. I narrate all my all my books. It's be the fourth book that I've narrated the audio book, and I think that the the popularity of podcasts and audio books really says something about how, as humans, we're really oral storytellers. Like we we've been listening to stories and speaking them aloud for way longer than we've been reading them. Right? You know, uh, reading is only you know a couple thousand years old, um, while oral storytelling is tens and tens of thousands of years old. And so there's something about the spoken word in the human voice that's very compelling. Yeah, and you you obviously, I think learning, to, uh, having done radio makes you a better television and video person because you- Makes you a better writer too. It's made me a better writer because it, radio the way NPR does it, it forces you to really get to the essence of an idea. Um, like you can't, if you're reading a book you, or a newspaper story, you can go back, you can hit the refresh page, whatever, go back to the previous page. But when you're listening to something, it's, you know, you've got to hold the audience's attention in real time and you have to remove anything extraneous and really get to the heart of the issue, what matters. And I really think working for NPR made me a better writer. I love hearing that. Uh, I'm, I'm always uh, asking my NPR friends that, did you always sound like this, or this is you sound like <laughs> you are now? Well, what was your accent growing up? Where did you grow up, and uh, did you have to adjust it, modulate it when you became an NPR correspondent? There's there's a, a pill they give you on the first day. You just you swallow it, and then you start sounding like you're on NPR, and you start getting very mellow. Yeah, um, it's <laughs> yeah, on the first the first that. day you work there. Yeah, um, yeah. So anyway, uh, just a a. a a word for the spoken word, which I love. I love that. Let's just uh, read some of the chapter titles here because they're so interesting. How to get out of bed like Marcus Aurelius. How to wonder like Socrates. How to walk like Rousseau. How to see like Thoreau. And it just goes on how to enjoy like Epicurus. Uh, how to fight like Gandhi. So I'm going to ask you about that in a second. How right. to be kind like Confucius. How to have no regrets like Nietzsche. And how to cope like Epi, uh, so I don't even know. Epictetus, the, the Stoic, Epictetus, yeah. Epictetus, and how to die like Montaigne. So right. let's uh, start with the Gandhi quote, how to fight like Gandhi. Well, let, let me say for a second that I, I the reason I organized the book that way is to keep it simple. Um, even though you may not know the names of all those philosophers, chances are you don't, you know what it means to struggle with questions like how to enjoy, how to fight, how to be kind. Um, and um, so I, I purposely try to keep it focused on the practical and the simple and uh, to offer uh, a hand to the reader and say, come with me. This is going to be painless. So, yeah, um, Gandhi, how to fight like Gandhi. Um, are you surprised by the, the way I titled that chapter? Yes. And I but I loved once you read the chapter, you understand exactly why you called it that. 
So I think Gandhi, all of these philosophers are misunderstood, by the way. Philosophers are like teenagers. No one really gets them, you know, right? They're all misunderstood, and some are more misunderstood than others. I think Gandhi is among the more misunderstood, because when people think of Gandhi today, they tend to picture this frail man who's very peaceful and a pacifist. And, and Gandhi was not a pacifist and was not frail. Um, he, in fact, really abhorred the, the term pacifism. Um, he thought there was nothing passive about his satyagraha or soul force. He thought it was very active um, and required great courage and great manliness. I was surprised how often in his writings the term manliness would appear. Um, it was a big deal to him. But he defined it very differently from the sort of John Wayne way that we do. Um, it for him, manliness was the the courage required to die for a cause, but not to kill for it or to harm anyone for it. And he thought someone facing down overwhelming force persistently but nonviolently, consistently nonviolent, was the the true hero. Um, and so really, Gandhi does teach us how to fight. And did you? Uh, wonder if you chose those words, how that would be received? I mean, I wanted to be uh, a little bit provocative, um, but truthfully provocative, and I, and I stand by it. I mean, uh, Gandhi would agree that um, he was all about fighting, but he was about fighting not enemies. He, he said he had no enemies. He only had adversaries, opponents. And of course, in, a, in our culture today, we tend to demonize our opponents and to turn them into enemies. Gandhi's goal was not to uh, condemn, but to convert, to convert his opponents to his side um, and to even go beyond a win-win outcome to, to sort of an outcome that were both sides are better off after fighting than they were before fighting, that they sort of have enlarged the pie while fighting over the pie. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, he, he was imperfect. And I, I'm sure there are people out there who would say, what about this and that crazy sex thing he did or slept with his grandnieces to test his celibacy? You can look it up. It's all there. And it's all true. Um, he was not perfect. Um, and his ideas probably would not work everywhere. They would, his nonviolent resistance, safe to say, would not have worked with Hitler. Um, even though Gandhi thought it probably would. Um, so he wasn't perfect, but he, you know, like all the characters in my book gave us a different way of looking at the world, a different way of looking at fighting. It's not all about overpowering your opponent and destroying them. There are other ways. Well, I just love, anytime I can talk about Gandhi, warts and all, I'm happy to. Right. And uh, just two years ago, speaking of, Retrospective travel. You had another word for it. What did you call it? Was it uh, that? No, re retrospective travel? Maybe the, yeah. <laughs> Retro travel. So two years ago, at, uh, just just before August of 2018, my wife and kids and I and our best friends uh, Andrew and May, we were able to travel to South Africa and go to his ashram in the Phoenix settlement in Durban and meet his granddaughter Ila Gandhi. And I would ask anybody who has a minute to go onto my Facebook and put in Ila Gandhi in my name. And you can watch us walk through the, uh, we did a Facebook live from there as she talked about her grandfather and learning from at his knee, she became a great uh, anti-apartheid uh, freedom fighter. And uh, she talks about the problems that he had and the issues and his right. uh, outlook on life. And so this is not something that's hidden but it's great to uh, have a chance to talk about that. So thank you, Eric. I, uh, I, I always love talking about uh, about uh, Gandhi. Let's see, my mom's watching from Kerala. Hi, I'm mom. <laughs> and uh, give you a chance, Eric, to say something about Kerala. I hope you made it there. Oh, yes. Uh, to Cochin, uh, on the rice boats, a um, few other places in Kerala. Um, Kerala has had a great reputation when I was there as sort of the most literate state in India. Uh, I don't know if that's still the case. 100% um, literate, yep. That's yeah, and uh, a, correct me if I'm wrong, Shree, but a state in India where uh, women have a lot of power. Yeah, the the very, you know, the, the, the women, there have been women leaders for a long time, but also just in the, in the structure of one of the right. dominant uh, communities there, the Nair community, N-A-I-R, uh, where from that community, uh, everything is matrilineal, 
rather than patrilineal, right. meaning things pass through the daughters. And so it's actually good to have daughters, unlike, you know, in a lot of other parts of India where it can be, you know, cases of female infanticide and all of that are very high. I'm sure you've done stories on all of those yeah, things. Right, but, right. Uh, but in Kerala, uh, women are, you know, there's still obviously lots of problems in any part. Women always bear a bigger burden and fair right. face obstacles. But uh, in Kerala, um, we're, we're, we're proud of a lot of things there. Uh, by the way, also, as you may remember, the world's first elected communist government. It can, that sounds right. like I was going to say that it, it was always held up as sort of a success story for communism. Um, yeah, because well, you know, the, it was the, elected the, government and uh, high, extremely high literacy. And um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I mean, th therefore, all the other parts of communism that uh, that have caused it to be a state that hasn't been as successful in certain areas. And that's why you see so many Keralites outside of Kerala. And yes. uh, and uh, working all over the world, and Ashok is also watching from Kerala, and uh, uh, he watches on a regular basis. Lote says, "Now I'm reminded of my college days in Delhi. You both should come back to Bhutan, and I'll be happy to show you around." Thank you so much. I think we should take him up on that. Yes. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I agree. I, I certainly yeah. agree. And. Uh, 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 Lote says, I can't believe Sri Yu and the great team pulled off 177 episodes. Kudos, great to see, learn from Eric Weiner always. And greetings from Bhutan and from New York. Don is watching. Hi, Eric. Congrats oh. on the books. On the books. Do you, you know everybody? I mean, these are like, I feel like all my friends are popping up here from around the world. We love so, that. That's um, so, uh, I mean, let me, can I ask you a question? Sure. I mean, it, it must be strange for you in a way. Your world has shrunk during this pandemic to this. Uh, what's the 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 perimeter, the uh, dimensions eight of your room? Feet, eight square feet. Eight square feet, right? You're in a little jail cell there, basically, with food passed under the door. But your your world has also enlarged through this show. Um, I mean, have you thought about that? I mean, and and how do you deal with? Um, you know, you're you're reaching people. Your your show is a success. It's in the middle of a pandemic. So your world has become both smaller and larger at the same time. Does that make your head explode or how do you deal with that? No, you're going to turn me into a philosopher and mellow me out. Right I now. will before the show's over, I swear. You, you, you will beat me into philosophy. <laughs> right. Uh, I, I, well, first of all, that is beautifully put. Nothing less than I would expect from Eric to understand the conundrum and the opportunity that a lot of us uh, are thinking about in, in times of peril. Uh, there's opportunity. And that's what I'm I'm dealing with here. I many people uh, know that I've been a chief digital officer at the Met, at Columbia, at the City of New York. Uh, I taught digital journalism for 20 plus years, and people have said to me more than one. I said, "Aren't you happy that everything you said has come true about digital?" And I said, "Not at the expense of the end of the world, right? Not at that. <laughs> that is not worth it for my 17-year-old children to turn 17." with their parents in the small apartment. That is not what I would want. Not to have 180,000 Americans dead at a time of something that, sure, we would have lost tens of thousands of people, but everything's been made worse by technology, by leadership, by media, by all kinds of elements that we use to make the best in the world. In some cases have brought out the worst in the world. and. Because of that, people are dying. Just look at masks and simple, something simple about let's wear a mask, let's go out, you know, and let's let's. And, let's and this is to, to go full circle to how we started the conversation. I think this is the the difference between information, I would say, and in, in wisdom, um, or knowledge and wisdom, is it's not really a lack of uh, information that is the problem, right? We we. Um, we, we, we know what can contain the virus. We don't yet have the knowledge to create a vaccine, to, to stamp it out medically with, you know, a vaccine. But we know what works. Um, and uh, this information is readily available. But the wisdom which is required to make decisions like, should we all make sacrifices to protect the most vulnerable? Or do we think that uh, the rights of the individual uh, trump, so to speak, the rights uh, of the group? I mean, these are these are philosophical questions. These are not scientific questions. And I know, you know, I have great respect for 
Anthony, Dr. Anthony Fauci and other scientists. But when people say uh, we should follow the science, I absolutely agree. But when they say that the scientists are all that's required to get us through this, that's where I disagree, that we really, we need moral leadership. We need people who can inspire us to make the wise choices. Um, because, you know, scientists can't do that on their own. Um, they can say wearing masks uh, is good science. It'll reduce the number of infections. But to motivate people um, to be wise, that requires, um, uh, Plato called them philosopher kings, maybe a philosopher president, a philosopher leader, someone whose uh, leadership is grounded in something. Uh, Marcus Aurelius uh, was a, a Roman emperor, one of the last good ones, as they say. And he ruled over uh, a quarter of the world during a plague, a time of plague, not unlike ours. And he was deeply steeped in Stoic philosophy. And he wrestled with all these issues. And um, he led from a place of moral conviction. He was willing to change those convictions as he thought about them more. But he, he had a grounding. And I, I worry that... Um, you know, would we elect a philosopher president now, or would we consider them too, you know, esoteric and not grounded enough? Um, I would argue that we'd be pretty well off with a, a philosopher president. I don't think we're going to have an immediate opportunity to find that out. No, perhaps not. Yeah, that's that's part of the adventure that we're all experiencing right now. Um, we have a few minutes left, folks, with Eric Weiner, the author of the Socrates Express, Life Lessons from Dead Philosophers. I'm going to ask him for, uh, towards the end, we're going to ask him for some more uh, life lessons. Uh, we don't want him to give away the book, but uh, certainly entice us. He's already told us so many great things. Uh, Vandana says, uh, one of our producers, that one of my favorite facts is that Socrates never actually wrote anything. She is correct. Socrates never wrote a single word. Um, he uh, did not publish and he perished. And he um, he did not uh, trust the the written word. He thought that uh, this new the new invention at the time called the book was dangerous, actually, that people's memories would deteriorate and that the art of conversation would be diminished. And he was actually right about that. Um, we have lost some of that. Um, and he believed that philosophy was conducted in conversation, that what, what we're doing right now is philosophy. You don't need to write it down necessarily. Um, never wrote a single word. And, and what, what about, what did that say about his state of, I mean, he was obviously literate, obviously, but, um, did people of his stature not write? What was, how unusual was no, that? No, people wrote, um, Plato and Aristotle, um, after him wrote, uh, plenty, um, but he thought, and, and this is kind of actually a thread throughout philosophy is, is while well, you think of philosophy as book centric that you get your head in books, lots of philosophers, including one named Schopenhauer, German guy from the 19th century warned against excessive reading. Like, in other words, you're just taking in the ideas of others and you're not really sitting with your own still small voice in your head and you're not. We don't really think for ourselves. Um, we're, we're inundated with this bombardment of information online. It was in books in the time of Schopenhauer and Socrates. Now it's online. And so we have all these ideas and these so-called convictions, but are they really ours or are they other people's ideas? And a lot of philosophers, even before the internet, have advocated tuning out, going offline, going off the grid for a while. And um, so it, th this, the danger of so dangers of social media are not new. Um, they're amplified and they're, you know, exponentially on social media. But the, the fundamental problem of, you know, acquiring other people's ideas and misinformation, I mean, misinformation is centuries old. And uh, just a chance for me to plug tomorrow's uh, book, and tomorrow's guest, uh, because nobody should read any other books, the most important book of all time we're discussing right now. And right. Eric's book, Eric, is the so Socrates Express. But, but after you finish that, after you finish my book, you can read your next guest book. No, but actually our next guest is an author, not an author. Oh, she's okay. <laughs> fighting disinformation. Her name is Melissa Ryan, and she has been fighting the intersection of politics, media, culture, 
helps people, policymakers, and institutions combat disinformation, extremism, and online toxicity. You can imagine how busy she is these days. And so we're delighted she's spending Friday night with us. Let's go back to our comments. There are lots of people checking in. Good evening from Long Island. Ashok is welcoming you to Kerala. Curry Row, as it's known in the East Village, for those who missed the early story, he went on a first date with his wife at a restaurant called Kismet. You cannot tell me that was a coincidence. You no, wanted to have was, a story to tell one day on a, something uh, called a podcast. It, 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 was, it was faded, yeah. I had to marry her at that point, you know. <laughs> yeah, no choice. <laughs> no choice. And uh, Sunny says, hello, Eric. Hi from hello, Houston. Hello, Sunny. Have you been to Houston? Yes, I have. And there's a large Indian population there for some yep. reason. I don't understand. A lot of uh, Bengalis in Houston. Who knows? <laughs> Why? And Why done? In San Francisco. And Ashok mm -hmm. says he just came back after being tested positive. They were in the first line treatment center for 10 days, ne tested negative, and on home quarantine for seven days more. We're keeping well and good now. Good to hear that, Ashok. You were a regular viewer in the early days, and I know you were away for a bit. Glad to have you back. But then I said, could use some kebabs from Nizamuddin. Right? <laughs> That's the play. neighborhood in Delhi where Eric lived. As yeah. The, as the what was the name of that restaurant? Kareem's, if anyone Kareem's. remembers Kareem's. Yes, yes, there man. we go. Let's uh, go. Let's go back. Um, Lote says, um, I'm reminded of my college days. He's talking yep. about that. And uh, Ashok says, the one good thing about Indians living in big cities like Delhi and Mumbai is that all people, whether extremely rich or poor, are happy in their own way and thinking. So that's a philosophical comment there. Uh, Sri, uh, Sri Shrisha uh, says, sir, what is your advice? Nationalism is relevant even now in the age of globalization. Please say something about Tagore's philosophy. Uh, we had an episode on Tagore uh, many, uh, several week, months ago uh, with my friend yeah. Nishita Ganguly. So I won't ask you to philosophize about his philosophy if you don't, if you're not familiar. Well, with I'll just say that I know I'm familiar with him. And I would say that uh, what I admire, just one little tidbit about Tagore that I admire is how he always kept learning. You know, he, he at the age of something like 65, he'd, you know, he was a poet and an educator all his life. He suddenly took up painting and was a pretty darn good painter. Um, and he, he never stopped learning and never stopped um, experimenting. And um, yeah, I think he was he was a great creative force. Also, not perfect, <laughs> and butted heads with Gandhi tremendously. Um, uh, the other question about nationalism, boy, I'm not uh, I'm not sure where she was going with that. That's probably a whole nother hour we can talk about that. Uh, Sriyasha is a doctor, I gather, and says, "What about the philosoph uh, philosophy of not looking at the background of patients? Uh, I guess uh, should it matter who you're treating?" Uh, I guess Rishi is looking for some wisdom from you on that. Like, does it matter uh, what the background of a patient is, or should you just look at the, you know? I mean, I'm expanding from that, but I'm kind of riffing on it. Yeah, but, that's a that's a tough question. Yeah. Um, I think you should uh, see, you should uh, learn about the background of the patient, and then it should not matter. You don't ignore it. You might need it uh, to diagnose and treat, yeah. um, but it should not influence how you treat the patient. Yeah, I think that's that's uh, that's a good way of thinking. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, so many comments here. I'm just trying to pick them because it's so. Uh, it, this is so cool that so many people are watching. That's great. Rose says uh, that she and Vandana are, are tweeting live. Listen to you on NPR, and of course, I recognize your byline from the New York Times. So that's it's not... going back a few years. Okay. <laughs> Lote says my best teacher from primary school in Bhutan, Annie Charles, is from Kerala. Wonderful to hear that. And my father, Sharmaji Ashok says, was the political secretary to EMS in the world's first communist ministry. Again, that it's so hard to reconcile, especially the communism we know today in China and in Cuba to think of an elected democracy, but that's that can happen uh, in Kerala. Mark is watching from Durham, North Carolina. Do you want to talk about the triangle and where you've been there? Um, you know, I wrote a book uh, before this one called The Geography of Genius, where I look at the connection between place and creativity, essentially. Um, and the triangle down there is a pretty creative place. Um, and Stanford and the whole Silicon Valley that has grown side by side with Stanford are pretty creative places as well. Uh, in that book, I have a chapter, I feel like I'm... <laughs> working for the Indian Chamber of Commerce here, but I have a chapter on, on Calcutta, as it was called back then, uh, and the Bengal Renaissance in the 19th century, of which Tugor was at the forefront of. And um, 
and it was an incredible time. Uh, if you want to read some about some an incredible explosion of creativity, it's it's Calcutta in the 19th century. Um, so yeah. Mark says that we all know Socrates, Aristotle, and even American philosophers like Mark Twain. Who are some of your guests not as well-known philosophers? Um, okay, in my book, for instance, I've got lots of, um, I've got a mix of people, right? Some you will know, like Socrates, uh, Nietzsche, I guess most people know, um, but uh, people don't think of Gandhi as a philosopher, he's in there. I have an 11th century Japanese woman writer named Sei Shonagan, who wrote an odd and fascinating little book called The Pillow Book. And her chapter is How to See Beauty in the Small. And uh, she had an incredible eye for detail and really taught me, and I hope will teach the readers, how um, we often overlook the small, don't take it seriously, diminish it. And there's great beauty to be found there. And um, Simone de Beauvoir is also in the book and a lesser known French philosopher named Simone Weil and um, a whole bunch of people. Amazing. Steve is talking to Rahajan saying, was talking with my daughter about this today. And Yogesh asks, what about Buddha? Yeah, I, I, it's hard to draw a line, particularly in South Asia, between philosophy and religion, because there really is no line, um, as you know. And so was the Buddha a philosopher or was he a religious figure? Um, I, I'd, I'd probably put him in the religious figure category, even though it's a religion founded on a philosophy, really. So I, I had to make some tough choices not to not to include uh, Buddha in, the, in this book. Mark he, says, gets, he gets plenty of airtime. Don't worry. He's good. Mark says, hasn't modern media created a bunch of pop philosophers? I think of folks like Elena Van Zandt, T.D. T. D. Jakes, and others. <sighs> yeah, I have mixed feelings about this. Um, on the one hand, you don't want to water down philosophy to the point of diluting it beyond recognition. On the other hand, if pop stands for popularizing, I'm all for it, right? Um, I, I want to actually popularize philosophy in a good way. That's the point of my book. Um, this is not a book for philosophy majors, although if you majored in philosophy, you may very well enjoy it and learn something. But it's a book for about philosophy for people who would never pick up a book on philosophy. So um, I, it's tricky. I think there's popularizing need not be negative. It can be a good thing. Okay, uh, Mark, you, you've set off a little uh, fight in the uh, a little, or at uh -oh. least agreement where Twyla says, Mark Lee, they're not philosophers. And Mark says, they're kind of my point. They coach themselves as modern day philosophers. They couch themselves. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, I'm trying not to get too hung up on, on titles because like we're all potential philosophers, I would say, if, if we're not all philosophers. And, um, uh, okay, yeah, there's there's definitely a little feud going on there. I'm sorry if I caused that problem, but, um, but um, you know, the, the, the problem is when we say, oh, he's a philosopher, she's not a philosopher, we, we, we end up excluding people from the conversation. And, and I don't wanna do that. Um, it is different from like, who's a doctor and who's not a doctor. I don't want someone operating on me because they say they're a doctor, but I'd like everyone to try philosophy. And, um, you know, it, it's sort of a way of life. If you, if you live and think like a philosopher, you're a philosopher. You don't need a PhD to, to be a philosopher. Of course, PhD is uh, uh, something that very closely associated with philosophy. And, uh, right. In the original sense of the word, I think, but yeah. A Mark, lover of wisdom. Right. One of the things I loved about Marquette's education, so he studied Marquette University, was we were required to take 21 hours in philosophy and theology. It was part of our Jesuit education. So it was a second minor for every student. Do you know other places that force folks? Yeah. To well, I know in France, uh, nationwide, all high school students are required to take a semester of philosophy before they can graduate. Wow. Now, why don't we do that in the U.S.? I don't know. Um, I think we should, given all the other courses that are requirements for graduation. I think one semester of philosophy uh, would be a brilliant idea. Um, so it sounds like we need to get you to Marquette because they are certainly uh, talking about this. Yeah, I mean, I, I and I think, um, 
you know, it's, hopefully it's taught in a way that makes it accessible and as an invitation to, to, to more learning. Sure. Uh, uh, Subalakshmi says, Tagore Shanti Niketan is another place in India one must visit. I've never been and I do want I've, to. I, I have been there and it is uh, it is still peaceful. And, and so Shanti Niketan was uh, Tagore's experiment in education. He started his school. It was like the unschool, basically. He was going to approach education from a radically different perspective. And it's still a university today, and you can still visit it. And uh, Ashok says he's subscribed to your newsletter. So let's give a uh, look. Yes, to your newsletter. I, have a, I have a newsletter. Um, I call it my Atlas of Ideas. And I call it that because that sort of sums up my approach to writing and life and what I do. Um, it's an atlas of ideas. I, I, I write at the intersection of place and ideas. So we haven't talked about this much, but in this book, it's called the Socrates Express for a reason. I take trains everywhere and I travel. Um, so I go to the village in Switzerland where Nietzsche did a lot of his thinking. Uh, I go to um, Berla House in Delhi where Gandhi lived and was assassinated. Uh, I go uh, to Stoic Camp in Wyoming uh, I go to Schopenhauer's hangouts in Frankfurt. So I'm it's kind of an odd duck in that I, I write about these two, in, in a way, bring together these two disparate worlds of travel writing and philosophy, place and ideas. So my newsletter is called My Atlas of Ideas, and I try to each uh, month bring people some fresh ideas about you know how to think about this intersection. By the way, what a brilliant idea to have a monthly newsletter instead of a weekly. I, <laughs> I almost was I almost didn't say monthly because I felt it, I thought it sounded kind of lame. I think you must have an hourly newsletter, Shri, because you're like just so like you probably have sent out a newsletter during this show. You're, you're so prolific in a social media way. So I just how do you how do you do it? Like how did you how did you how did you get into this space? <laughs> Well, who's interviewing you? Who here? But uh, sorry, I, it's old habits die hard. I can't help it. That. You're very kind. I would just say that it really helps to have awesome colleagues and an awesome family. You need both in today's world. It takes a village and a village idiot to uh, make. <laughs> and so we. Okay. I'm, I'm but you really seem glad. you seem to have a natural affinity for the, making these connections and in reaching people. And I, I, I applaud it seriously. I don't, it's it is a talent. It's a skill. Okay. So it means a lot. Everyone go to ericweinerbooks.com and the newsletter tab, and you can download and, and sign up for the newsletter. Vandana says Tagore's nationalism is brilliant and so relevant today. And Subalakshmi recommends Ramakrishna, another Indian philosopher. Yes. And mystic. Ashok says small is always beautiful. And, the, and uh, Jonathan is praising the pillow book is a key to Japanese aesthetics. And we know Steve and that's what, yeah. other and that's, love, and that's Love yes, that. and that's what I, I write about. Um, if you want to understand uh, the iPhone, uh, read the pillow book or read my my encounter with the pillow book. And that's the way I like to think of these my relationship with these philosophers. I encounter them, you know, and they're 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 fully formed human beings. You know, they're imperfect as Gandhi was. Um, they're struggling like we are with the meaning of life. They, none of these people were saints. They didn't have all the answers. They just wrestled with the questions a little more courageously and heroically than most of us do. But we can we can be like them as well. We don't have a lot of time left, but this is as, as soon as rebirth is introduced into a question. Oh, I like rebirth. Yes. Yeah. Heidegger. So okay, we'll we'll skip over Heidegger and his uh, skeletons in his closet, and uh, the end of philosophy. No, it's not the end of philosophy. You know, Plato once said, uh, "What is." Uh, cherished in a country is cultivated there. And uh, if we cherish classical music, we'll have lots of great classical composers. If we if we uh, cherish uh, pop music, we'll have lots of pop musicians. And if we cherish philosophy, we will have lots of great philosophers. Philosophy uh, is not dead. Uh, it's gone to sleep for a little while. It's sleeping. It's not dead. Um, if you read my book, you'll help wake it up and wake yourself up in the process. Our other uh, producer, Rose Horowitz, says, reading Socrates, Aristotle, St. Augustine, Schopenhauer changed my life in college. I miss reading and talking about ideas. This is great fun. Good. Thank you, Rose. And like, I feel like we, we need to make time for sitting down like this, wrestling with the big issues of life, the practical issues of how to live. And we're so busy. 
You know, I mean, a lot of, you know, I sort of say in the book at one point that good philosophy is slow philosophy. And I think that's true. And it's slowing down as a sort of a prerequisite for doing philosophy. And we're, we're moving too fast. Um, even in a pandemic, we seem to be both stuck and moving too fast at the same time. I don't know how we do it. I completely agree. Yeah. Rose says, I see you profile some women in your book, but doesn't this book reinforce the prevalence of Western culture? Could there be a sequel? Um, there can always be a sequel. Um, and you're right that most of philosophy is associated with Western philosophy, but I do have Gandhi in there who was not Western and Seishonagan uh, and Confucius. The West does not have uh, a monopoly on wisdom by any means. Um, and yeah, a absolutely. There could be, there could be a book that featured only Eastern philosophers or African philosophers. Or will, or women only, right? Or so. women only. Sirsha says, please visit Belur once. And uh, George says, University of Chicago undergrad, two years of great books, based general studies, uh, taught by great philosophers, required for a BA. That's true. Even Columbia has a very famous- uh, Core uh, curriculum, the CC, I believe it's yeah. called. Yeah. That's, yeah. And uh, Vandana has put in a link to the newsletter. And Thank Ashok you. says, great show and thanks for making my day. You know, he's up early. It's uh, 7 a.m. now in India. And uh, Thanks 7 for getting up, Ashok. <clears throat> Uh, and Rose is quoting you, uh, talking about me. And <laughs> is, I missed some of this, so we'll catch the replay. Thank you, Eric Weiner, Sri Rose, and Mandana. And Jonathan says, Great show, useful in the search for the good, the true, and the beautiful. Thank you. What a no, I like that phrasing the good that can I borrow that, Jonathan? Ask him, uh, because I like that the, the good, the true, and the beautiful. And that's that's sort of a recurring theme in my book is the good, the true, and the beautiful. Um, seeing unexpected beauty, um, seeing the world a bit differently. And, you know, we think of philosophy as maybe the search for truth or an analytical way of looking at the world, but really it's an exercise in seeing the world otherwise, seeing it a bit differently. You know, the way you read a Rose good says novel. I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was going to say, Rose says, I have to look at the pillow book. Sounds fascinating. You were saying about a good novel. When you read a good novel, when you put it down, you know, the world looks fresher, different to you for several days afterwards sometimes. And good philosophy has that same effect. You read it, and then afterwards you start to see things a bit differently. Uh, uh, we have uh, someone writing in, I wish philosophy was required in college. Thanks. And if you already graduated from college, get buy the book. If you're still in college, buy the book. And it's called... I think, the... I think philosophy will be required by the end of the show. Um, <laughs> because we're... We seem to have a quorum of people who are like, yes, let's require it. Um, yeah. I, School I saw of practical philosophy. Yes. There, yeah. there are, yeah. there are various attempts out there. Elaine, the button an author, fellow author has a school of life out of London and, and other cities. And I would say that there is, and of course this isn't only me, there is a, a kind of a renaissance of philosophy that's, um, that's taking place. Uh, Stoicism in particular, we haven't talked much about that, but that is, it's an ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, and it has a huge following now, uh, particularly in Silicon Valley. It's uh, Stoicism in particular is making something of a comeback. Well, that's part of all the stuff that we're all, so much we have to learn. Like that's one of the things we've learned in the pandemic. Jonathan saying you love the Pillow book, and Mark says there were great, some great philosophers in Native American culture and African countries. Yogesh is pointing out that Gandhi believed in the caste system. He did. In I mean, there we we've said multiple times that Gandhi was not perfect. Uh, no and, one. And, and this is this is where it gets tricky. Um, and this is a whole another show. We could talk about cancel culture and everything that's going on. But you know, what do you do with someone from the past who had a lot of great ideas and some really bad ideas? You know, do you do you keep the good ones and throw away the bad ones, or do you cancel the whole person? That's a whole another subject. And same thing about artists who were good at their art, but do you, you know, when you look at the man, in cases behind the art, there are some issues. Uh, Shirsa says, what about Swami Vivekananda? I think you're going to hear about every famous Indian and you're going to be responsible for not putting them in your book. Vivekananda, he was the guy who came to Chicago, right? And brought, uh, brought um, the whole idea of, of Hinduism and, and uh, Indian religion to, in was it 1893, to the Chicago World's Fair. There was a parliament of world religions, and he's a, fasc he's a fascinating character. 
He, he absolutely is. Well, I'm going to let you go, Eric. I told you we do about 45 minutes. Here we are, uh, almost 90 minutes into our. We time. could keep going for three more days. <laughs> uh, uh, Lote says uh, thank you, thank you, Eric and Sri and team for this wonderful storytelling and learning opportunity. Best wishes and a good weekend. And uh, Rose says Jonathan's comment on how philosophy looks at the good, the true, and the beautiful makes me think of Pla Pla Plato's forms. Uh, however, in poetry, there is always philosophy, you know? Ooh, that's another hour conversation. <laughs> um, maybe in good poetry, you, you put philosophy aside for a minute and you simply uh, dwell in the beauty of the moment. Um, there's kind of a philosophy of no philosophy that there's a time to actually stop thinking entirely and uh, appreciate, say, a piece of classical music or a beautiful poem, and that that, that even operates on a different different level. I'll let you go by just okay. asking you about about the elections and what should we be thinking about uh, with the you know in my mind uh, the the terrible situation we're going to face just in the run up to the election what's going to happen afterward no matter who wins and all of that what is a philosopher's approach to this you have to really decide what what matters to you and what doesn't what doesn't you want to know that the big things are big and the small things are small and know the difference between the two so i think it's a time for clarity and uh, without endorsing one candidate or another just ask yourself what matters to you what qualities in the person matters to you um and because they they're not just personal qualities right they they represent something that will be carried on into policy and into our lives. Um, so it's it's a really simple question of what matters to you. And you may decide that it's uh, that it's the way that a candidate's hair color. And I doubt that though. You're probably, if you stop for two seconds, you're gonna decide it's not that, it's something else. But what is that something? And can you articulate what matters? And and once you do, and you get clarity on this, this is what Socrates, bring it right back to Socrates, he thought that once you really know something, then your choices become much more obvious. Like once you know what courage really is, you'll become courageous. So once you know what the choice is in this election, what really matters, the choice will become clear. Is that too philosophical of an answer, perhaps a little? <laughs> I, I think it's a, uh, it's a great answer and something that a lot of us will... Uh, be thinking about as we are trying to understand everything that's that, that's going on. And it's so difficult, I think, to understand all that's happening. And so you're giving us lots of advice and wisdom here. Mark says, great conversation. Just have to bring Eric back soon. So I would uh, agree. You know, one I'll end on this, that one, uh, one definition of what we're doing here, this kind of philosophical discourse is enlightened kibitzing, to use the Yiddish word, and I feel like that's what we've engaged in, enlightened kibitzing. Um, maybe th there's a Malayalam Malay Malay term for that. I don't know. But, um, you know, uh, and, and lots of cultures have it, but let's. It's, it's great. It's great. I really enjoyed this. Thank you. And uh, everyone, please follow Eric on Twitter. Is Eric underscore Weiner on Twitter, ericweinerbooks.com, and check out his book. Uh, I know it's, I know, Eric, it couldn't have been well done. Nice. Uh, <laughs> Very subtle. Done. Very Thank subtle. You. No, no, you've got to do it. I, I make all my authors hold their books up. There, okay. you, there you go. Uh, well, one thing I would I would say to uh, you, I know it's not easy trying to publish a book in a pandemic. People are distracted. But you also have an opportunity to have conversations with people you otherwise may not have had and reach people that way too. So we wish you the very best always. Uh, Eric Weiner has been my guest. I'm going to put one of the things we do on the show, Eric, is to bring back uh, the reintroduce guests because people tune in kind of in the middle of the evening they're not sure exactly what's going on so i'm going to reintroduce you here but say goodbye and thank you eric uh, thank night. you so much Ray. this was a real pleasure take thank care you. our guest was uh eric weiner the author of the socrates express in search of life lessons from dead philosophers best-selling author of the geography of bliss his books have been translated into more than 20 languages especially the languages of bulgaria and indonesia and he is also a former New York Times writer for more than 10 years, a business reporter, among other things. And at NPR, he was the first Indian 
correspondent for NPR, India-based correspondent for NPR. Uh, thank you very much. This brings us to the end of another show. But before we go, one of the things I asked the amazing uh, Columbia Law School professor, Kimberly Crenshaw, how can we be allies of the black community? And she said very simply, say their names. So I'm going to do that right now. Our friend Rahajan uh, put, pulled together a list of names and uh, asked us to read it. And so I'm gonna do that uh, with you right now. It's uh, a chance for me to uh, do what Kimberly asked, uh, which is to share their names and it's a long list. So what we're gonna do is um, look back on, you know, every day we're gonna do a small, a small sec section of the list. And this is the tragedy that the list is so long. And I'm very grateful to Rahajan for pulling this list together and helping us to understand these names and have them here. So let me pull that up so you can see it. And uh, these are the uh, say their names list uh, that he put together for nine two. So let me see if I can blow this up a little bit and uh, you can all see it. So uh, I will read this uh, note and, and read these names. Uh, these are names of people who've been killed by police, um, shot by police and killed by white supremacists uh, in this country. So let us um, read the names. Um, Dijon Kizzy, Damian Daniels, Anthony Huber and Joseph Rosenbaum killed by white supremacist on August 25th. Jacob Blake shot by police still with us. Uh, Vice President Biden met with him. Danny Buckley, Trayford Pellerin, Andres Guardado, David McAtee, George Floyd, Brianna Taylor, Ahmad Arbery, Michael Dean, Tatiana Jefferson, Elijah McCain, McLean, Elijah McLean, Botham Jean, Antoine Rose II, 17 years old, Danny Ray Thomas, Stefan Clark, Anthony Weber, age 16, Heather Heyer, killed by a white supremacist, as you may remember, in Charlottesville, Aaron Bailey, Keenan King and Anthony Holmes Garriquez, Charlena Siobhan Lyles, Tommy Lee, Jordan Edwards. And this is a um, story close to home, as you can imagine, for one of the names is Srinivasa Kuchibotla and Ashok Madasani shot by white supremacists on, 20, uh, on February 22nd, 2017. Quinice Hayes, Chad Robertson, Mohammed Muhayim Jr., Terence Crutcher, Larnell Bruce, Corin Gaines, Joseph Mann, Philando Castile, Alton Sterling, Kaylin Rockmore, Janet Wilson. I'm going to pause there because this list will keep going and we want to um, read a portion of those names every day on this show. And thank you to Rahajan for putting that together. Imagine that list. Imagine that this a list exists like that. And uh, I always like to show this cover story of Time Magazine, a painting by Titus Kaffer. You see a mother with a child snatched from her, the blue glove of the pandemic. And on the right, a photo that many people have not seen before it was published in Time Magazine. You're seeing a young Larcinia Floyd and her son, George. Larcinia would die two years to almost the day that he would be killed. And they are now buried together in Houston. He was killed, of course, murdered on video in Minneapolis. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for your support of this show. Thank you for your guest ideas. Thank you for suggesting yourselves as guests. We would love to have you on our show. We have great guests and topics all the time. We're always looking for more. Uh, we have uh, tomorrow night, Fighting Disinformation, Melissa Ryan, an expert on extremism, disinformation, and online toxicity will be our guest. On uh, Saturday morning, we have a guest who will talk about schools reopening from a child psychiatrist and child psychologist point of view. Uh, on Monday, we have the author, Janine uh, Guerrero, who is the author of a book called Hate Monger about Stephen Miller. So you don't want to miss that. That's on Monday night at 9 p.m. Thank you as always for your support of this show. Thank you to our sponsors. A big shout out to them. We're always grateful uh, to them for their support. She's on call. Make sure you watch the new episode Sunday um, at 11. This week, uh, we're doing a 
best of uh, episode. So check that out. And we're also uh, grateful to our friends at Rise or Fall Together, the One Shared World Interdependence Summit, Thursday, September 17th, 9 to noon Eastern time, oneshared.world, a free conference with some world famous speakers. Uh, we're also grateful to Charles Cunnan Carroll and his book, The Inventor in You, a step-by-step -step guide to your first invention. Charles is the developer of more than 80 patents at Inventor Charles and his, and his website, guidetoinvention.com. And a big thank you to Muckrack Academy and its fundamentals of social media, free certification now available, mrac.co slash social, mrac.co slash social. And finally, to nonbelievable.com, divinely delicious cookies on a mission. Each handcrafted cookie provides a meal to those in need. One cookie equals one meal. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you for being here. One other way that you can help out the show is to subscribe to us on YouTube, youtube.com slash Srinet. Please grab that uh, and follow, uh, please. And I want to tell you about this QR code. It is an alert for whenever I'm live. It's not a WhatsApp group. It's a gentle WhatsApp alert. Just hold up your phone and you'll know when we are alive. Otherwise, follow me on Facebook and on Twitter at Sri and on LinkedIn. We're live on all those platforms. Check out the Socrates Express from Eric Weiner. We're so grateful to everybody for being here, all your support. We are so grateful. See you again onwards to episode 180, six months in a row of episodes on this show. 